Recording in progress. Anybody have any questions while we're waiting for everybody else to show up? I'm available. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, well, looking on Canvas, I saw that there are um, two test fours. Yeah, that's what uh, someone just posted on chat. I'm looking at it now. There's uh, okay. one that's listed as important assignments. Uh, that shouldn't be there, but it looks like somehow it actually became active. Must have been something I set by accident or something, not realizing there was two in there because the other one is set up in the appropriate place. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of one of them just so I can keep track of which is which. Let's change the name on this one down here and see what's going to happen. Oh, man, it's taking too much time. Okay, let's see now.
Now I'm going to look in the grade book and see where that one actually is. Um, the imported one would have been on, would be due on the 19th, and the other one's due on the 29th. Yeah, it looks like I that help? might have fell for the wrong one, uh, and only one student took, quote unquote, the one that I fell for, which should have been the right one. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I have to fix that. All I'll do is I'll just, oh, I see it now. Yeah, it looks like the majority of people took obviously the one that I put in the wrong place. Uh, well, actually that I put in the technically the right place, which is why y'all took it. Uh, I'm just gonna move it over there and I'll copy all the scores over and uh, make sure that one doesn't work so that uh, make sure it doesn't grade. In other words, actually it's already that way Oops, what did I just do there? I just moved the wrong thing. Yeah, I moved the wrong thing. So yeah, it's it appears that uh, the, there's one now that has an asterisk on the end of its name. That one is in fact the one that's uh, doesn't actually count towards your grade, but that also happens to be the one that everybody but two people took. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'll do is I'll transport, they should be identical. I'll double check, make sure that's the case. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll just uh, take all the grades that everybody got on that one and uh, put it on the other one. And then that way everybody's grades will be right. So I'll do that right after class. So sorry about that. Anybody else have any other questions? about anything course related past material anything like that so basically as long as you've done one uh, don't worry about it yeah as long as you did one of them it, uh, you're fine uh okay, it looks cool. like the i still have two people <laughs> that didn't uh take it and i wonder what date that's due i'm gonna check that real quick yeah, this one says, uh, it said March 19th was the original due date, but I pushed it back to March 26th, uh, but now it's closed. So I still have two people that didn't do it. Uh, those people should probably email me or they might be dropped. So uh, everybody else had done it, so it shouldn't be a problem. But like I said, I do have two people that didn't actually do that. So I don't know what the deal is with, uh, with test four, but a lot of people didn't do it. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. Two people hadn't done it. So, all right. Any other questions? I'll take care of that right after class. It looks like I did have the wrong one in the uh, in the online test module. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll just move to the correct one to there and it'll be uh, the grades will work out that way. All right, still got people coming in. It's now five after time to start for class, so let's get uh, started. So we were talking last time about, uh, I think we did a little bit on mutual inductance. I uh, just showed you what that was. Now I'm gonna go into self-inductance and then we'll go into uh, basically the type of circuits you'll have for self uh, for self-inductance. So for starters, what we learned about uh, last time was that we had, uh, I use black. We had uh, mutual inductance, and mutual inductance, for instance, you might have uh, a wire coming down like this. Actually, let me uh, share my screen with you because that might be helpful if I'm drawing something for you. <laughs> okay. Should work now, hopefully. Let's see. Okay, so what you can imagine is maybe uh, this circuit is, uh, actually, let me take that line out, let that mark off. This circuit has, let's say, uh, in two coils, and then right next to it is another circuit that has in one coils. And what's going to happen is if you actually send a current, say, I1 through this, then that's going to create a magnetic field. Let's say it goes like this. 
And in fact, not, not much of it's going to actually get over to there, but I'm just trying to exaggerate it. And there's ways you can actually make it get, go further over to this other uh, coil. For instance, I could, instead of just having them next to each other, I could stick an iron uh, horseshoe stake through one and then through the other. And if I did that, that would actually stretch out the magnetic field lines so that they would actually uh, stay a little closer to parallel with the path through N1. But what we found is that the, uh, the actual flux through to, which we'd call phi two one, that would be the magnetic flux through circuit two as a result of circuit one. So through to, do to one that's the wording i'm using up there okay well what we found is that actually is proportional to i one okay in other in other words obviously the stronger the current that goes through n one uh, the stronger the magnetic field, and the stronger the magnetic field, of course, the stronger the flux, because as we know, flux is given by, at least the magnetic flux is given by the integral of B dot dA. So we could say A, for instance, is the little cross-sectional end of, of circuit two. Uh, the constant of proportionality is something that we call uh, the mutual inductance, so that M21 would in fact be equal to that flux phi two one over the current I one. Okay. In other words, I was saying phi two one uh, is proportional to uh, M two one and I one like that. So I'm trying to solve for M two one. But what we also find out is that uh, if if that flux is through, say, one little loop, let's say this loop right here, then the total flux through that would actually be n two times that. So that's what the mutual inductance is. And your book does exactly two examples in the very beginning of chapter 30. And those two examples are the only questions that I'd really ever ask you about that. So uh, be understand those examples, which I did work uh, last time, I think. Understand those examples and you'll be fine. Uh, and I say understand. Be able to redo them because uh, really it's, it's not that easy to understand. It's, it's, it's okay. I mean, uh, the main thing is once you are told that M21 turns out to be equal to the same thing as M12, and therefore we can just call them both M. Once you figure that out, then you know pretty much all the, the science that's necessary for doing that. Then it's just a matter of basically engineering or engineering design where if in principle, if you had you know knowledge of Maxwell's equations, you could uh, make a better statement about exactly what the, those quantities are, those mutual inductances are, uh, but we don't have that usually and, and that would be such a esoteric application that you need not worry about it so just learn those two examples in the very beginning of chapter 30 uh which is on uh mutual inductance and and you have more than enough knowledge for any tests i'll give you at least regarding mutual inductance now we go on and define something called self-inductance and this is something that we'll use a lot more of and the self-inductance Remember, this is mutual. And remember also, mutual inductance is really the thing that allows us nowadays to charge cell phones by just laying them on their back on a charger or to take a, I have like a Philips Sonicare type toothbrush thing and that just sticks in this little cradle and there's not any physical plugs that plug in or plug out or anything like that but it charges and it charges by this mutual inductance. So that's, that's what that's all about. So it's kind of nice to at least know that. 
But what we're going to talk about now is the self-inductance. The self-inductance, which is also just inductance. In other words, we usually don't even use the word self-inductance. And that's just given the symbol L. And in fact, the self-inductance we define to be uh, pretty much in the number of turns that the object whose self-inductance is L is, uh, so has. So if you imagine some object has N turns, then its self-inductance will be L times the magnetic flux through those N turns divided by the current that created the, that magnetic flux. Okay, so that's the self-inductance. Both the uh, mutual inductance and the self-inductance, which is also called the inductance, have the same unit. It's called the Henry. And it's abbreviated with just a capital H. And in fact, the Henry is uh, equal to one. Well, there's a lot of ways you can look at it. You can see that it's, for instance, uh, one. If I just look at flux, I know that's Tesla meters squared. That's what flux is. And then I'm going to multiply that by seconds because dividing by current, which is amps, amps is coulombs per second. So uh, putting the C in the bottom and the S in the top is basically due to that I being in the bottom. But it turns out you can also write it another way. It turns out to be a volt second divided by an ampere. So that's another way uh, it could come into play. Now, if you look at volts and realize what happens when you divide volts by amps, then you see that from, from V equals IR, V over I should just give you the units of ohms or should give you the, the resistance, which is the unit of ohms. So you can also call this an ohm second. Okay. So that's what those units uh, are just for confirmation. Yes. Uh, what's the T? That's the Tesla oh, from Tesla. magnetic field strength. Named after Nikolai Tesla, not the car. <laughs> But the car is named after Nikola Tesla, too. So in that sense, it is. <laughs> All right. So let me show you how to do that. Now, this is a big, this is like the first step of that other paradigm that I've been war warning you about the whole semester. So the two paradigms are this. Uh, one paradigm. I just started using this word like this. Actually, I've used it in this context for a long time. But recently, I've been learning, uh, teaching myself Latin, and they talk about paradigms on there. So I, that's probably why I'm infected my language with this. So I apologize if it's aggravating to you. But one uh, paradigm was we use Gauss's law, which is the closed integral of E dot dA equals Q enclosed over epsilon naught, or we use Coulomb's law. And that allows us to get the electric field. Then we use V equals a negative integral of E dot DL to get the voltage. And then we use C. Dang it, I, hate, I hate this thing. It keeps changing to a stupid keeps changing to a stupid eraser. Then we use C equals Q over V to get the capacitance. That's one of the paradigms, okay? Now this other paradigm, the one we're talking about now, is we use Ampere's law, the closed integral B dot DL is equal to mu zero I enclosed or B O of art 
to get us the magnetic field? B equals question mark. I don't like the way that wrote that book bad. So anyways. Then we use flux is equal to the integral of B dot DA to find the flux. And that's the flux due to the magnetic field, which is called the magnetic flux. And then we use L is equal to N phi over I to calculate the inductance. So you can see that's the two major things that I'm wanting you to be able to do. So first off, let's let's talk about uh, let's let's implement one of those paradigms. So uh, example. What is the inductance of a solenoid that has in turns and a area a and length lowercase l okay so that's the problem we're going to work now what i'll do is i'll draw a uh i'll draw a solenoid for you guys uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to imagine the solenoid is in fact a bunch of little wires some reason your the stupid program is making all my circles into uh squares so that that's helpful that, that helped a lot the way that happened i'm really appreciative of that uh uh let's do it a different way let's say okay that's that's basically the current coming in whoa nearly that's basically the current coming in to the solenoid say so imagine a current i it comes out there and then that goes down, of course, into the page and then curls back and comes up here again, like this. And that's basically making your solenoid. And the reason why I showed that first part with the current coming out of the page is so we could figure out it, it basically in which direction the magnetic field is going to actually point. Okay. And then ultimately, this will come out here. So that's our solenoid. And what I mean is if I look at it this way, I see the area A. With the wires wrapped around it, with that one going up there, say. Okay. So that's what it looks like from the left hand side is that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine, uh, since the current is going this way, I know the magnetic field is actually going through it like this. so on and so forth. Like this, okay, so there's your magnetic field B. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to uh, uh, make an Amperian loop that basically goes this way here 
that way up there, that way up there, and then this way right here. That's my Ampyrean loop. And my hypothesis is that B is equal to maybe B of Z I hat inside, but zero or approximately zero elsewhere. Okay. So what I've actually imagined here is an X axis that goes basically right here and a Z axis that goes right there. So that's why I allow B to be a function of Z because maybe it has a little more strength as you get a larger and larger Z or something like that. Okay. Now, because I define B to be zero elsewhere, you can see that the right-hand side of this Ampyrean loop is essentially going to have a magnetic field equal to zero. Uh, the top part of this loop is going to have a magnetic field equal to zero. Now, it won't be completely zero, but it's going to be so small compared to the really magnified magnetic effects within the solenoid. The solenoid actually makes a very strong magnetic field because it's got you know so many turns. Uh, which, by the way, let me remind you that this length right here is L, and the number of turns equals N, and that means the turns per unit length is just N over L. Okay. So I've got my hypothesis, and now what I want to do is apply Ampere's law. I'm going to turn to the next page, and according to Ampere's law, the closed integral of B dot DL is equal to mu zero I enclosed. So I'm going to start off with the left-hand side, and the closed integral of B dot DL has to be over a complete closed path. That's why I drew that whole circuit there of a, a part going to the right, then a part going up, and then a part going to the left, and then a part going down. So what that's going to become is the integral, and I'll say over the left side, of zero dot, in this case, uh, actually I should say over the right side. So I'll say the right side of zero dot, in this case, is going to be dzk hat, because I'm trying to go in the positive uh, z direction, plus the integral of zero dot negative dx i hat, because that's where I'm going to the left. So that's the top part, plus the integral over the left side, which is zero dot, in this case, it's uh, negative dz k hat, plus the integral of b of z i hat dotted with dx i hat, which should just give me basically B of Z because we're going on a fixed Z since I'm going along the X direction anyways. And then I just get the integral from X equals zero to L of DX times I hat dot I hat, which of course is just one. So you can see I just get B of Z times L. Uh, actually, let's say this is uh, the part that I, the, the part that I uh, underline, for instance, let's say that is L1, so we don't confuse it with the actual length. So I'm going to go back here and mark that. Say uh, this distance from here 
to here is L1. Okay, so everybody follows what I'm doing with that drawing now. Notice that L is different from the whole length. That's why I went back and changed it. I didn't want to use just uh, actual L for that. So now I've got the left-hand side. Now the right-hand side of Ampere's law is mu zero I enclosed, which you can tell from this part right here that basically I've got a bunch of currents going uh, through that. And those currents, in fact, can be looked at like there's a dot coming out, 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 there's a dot coming out. What I know is the number of, of turns per unit length is lowercase n. So I can just say, well, this is going to be mu zero times I. But then I'm going to have to say, well, that I repeats itself. It comes through that first wire, then the second wire, the third wire, through all the wires in that length. Well, that length is L1, and the number of wires per unit length is lowercase n. So I'm going to write this as n times L1. And that's, in fact, the right-hand side of Ampere's law. So now I'm going to set the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. And when I do that, I get B of Z times L1 is equal to mu zero I N times L1. At this point, we can now see that clearly no Z came into play. So we can drop that argument Z. Evidently, B is going to be a constant uh, and in fact, we can now say that B, oh, I should keep writing that red, sorry about that. We're going to say our conclusion is that B is equal to a piecewise function, and that piecewise function is mu zero N times I in the I hat direction inside the solenoid. And it is approximately zero outside. Okay, so that's what we got for our magnetic field. Now, I, I need to get L, which is equal to N times magnetic flux over I. So what do you choose for the surface over which the flux is. Well, you try to find the surface that's bounded. Uh, well, in, in this case, you just try to find a surface that actually has the magnetic field going through it as close to perpendicular as possible, because the closer and closer you are to perpendicular to that uh, surface area, the, the most flux you'll get out of it. So what I'm now taking into consideration is I am looking at the solenoid again which is going to look like this with an area A. And remember, here's that wire coming down. And slipping off away to that side and then coming back around here and coming back around here and then coming back around here. Obviously, it's supposed to be a little neater than that, but that's basically the point. And what we have here on this side, we actually have the magnetic field lines going in. But the vast majority of them, by the time they hit the magnetic, by the time they hit the end of that cross, uh, cross section of the actual solenoid, Let's say this is the last part right here. What we can see in here is again an area A and again magnetic field lines that come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. So that you see, in fact, uh, DA
points that way as well. Now that we have all that in mind, so this, this little three dots right here is just showing that I'm skipping a lot of the coils on the inductor and I'm looking now at the other end of the inductor so that I can see that the magnetic field lines are coming out of it. So now I can calculate that the flux is actually the integral of B dot DA. That's the second step, remember, in the paradigm I was telling you about. So in this case, I'm going to get the integral of uh, B I hat dot uh, basically differential area element times I hat as well. So this ultimately gives you, in fact, just B times A, and we already found that B is mu zero N times I, and then, of course, A is just going to be A. Now, you, we can also write this, and this will come in handy, for instance, in a few. We can also write this as mu zero N I A over L, the total length of the inductor. Okay, notice I just used plain L then, not L1. So both of these are actually valid expressions for the magnetic flux. Uh, is small n the charge density? Yes. Uh, uh, well, not the charge density, but it's the coil density. So it's the number of turns of that solenoid per unit length. Okay. So if you had like 100, uh, 100 turns and the thing was two inches, it'd be basically 0 0.02 uh, turns per inch. If we wanted to use such god-awful units as inches, that is. <laughs> All right, so now that we have flux, we can go ahead and calculate uh, N, or excuse me, L. So L is equal to N times phi over I. But for this case, uh, N is actually the uh, number of turns of the solenoid. So we're now going to say, okay, well, I'm going to put in the N, and then I'm going to put in the phi, and then I'm going to divide all that by uh, I. So right here, I'm going to say this is mu zero N over L, I'm just putting it on top for ease, times A, and all of that will be over I like that. So we can see immediately that this is going to cancel out. And Trying to remember. Okay, uh, the, that cancels out, and I get, whoa. For some reason, I'm getting two ends here. Is that right? Let's see. Yeah, I guess that's okay. All right, so this is going to be equal to mu zero. Whoa. I had to switch colors. That's going to be equal to mu zero n squared a. over L. And that should be basically our inductance. I'm double checking to see if I actually uh, miscalculated the inductance. No, I got it right. That's cool. Just want to make sure. I think previously I'd worked it out where I got it in. I, I just must have forgot one of the ends when I did it the last time. So my final answer here is L for a solenoid. is equal to mu zero n squared a divided by l okay and i'll box this off so that's the complete paradigm worked out in detail so you've now seen how to start with ampere's law to find the magnetic field then step two was using the definition of flux to calculate the magnetic flux. And then step three was using L is equal to N phi over I 
to calculate the actual inductance or self-inductance of a solenoid. So we now have that. And an example, for instance, would be Let's say, uh, what is the inductance of a long, tightly wrapped solenoid containing n terms of length? Uh, what I want to know is, let's say, if n is equal to 200 and L equals, let's say, 15.0 centimeters that's pretty big for an inductor by the way and a is actually going to be equal to 0 0.500 i'm going to try to keep three sig figs on everything so i'll put a dot by the 202 uh that's going to be in centimeters squared i want to know what is Okay, so obviously L is equal to, this is our solution, L is equal to mu zero N squared A over L. So I'm going to do four pi times 10 to the negative seventh. Remember that's Tesla meters per amp is what the units of mu zero are. I'm gonna write 200 squared, and I'm gonna write A is 0 0.500 centimeters squared. But in order to do this, I actually have to have that in appropriate units, which would be square meters. So I'm now gonna take this and multiply it by uh, one meter is equal to 100 centimeters and then i'm going to square that and then that'll of course take care of all that so now i've got the area up there the n squared up there and ultimately i'm just going to divide by 15 or 0 0.150 meters and I'll put my answer right here. So now calculating that, I'm going to say four times pi times one e to the negative seven. Whoa. Times 200 squared times point five and now i'm going to divide that by 100 squared times the point one five zero and that gives me 1.676 carrying one extra sig fig of course 1.676 times 10 to the negative fifth Henry's, which if I divided the 10 to the negative fifth by 10, that would make it 10 to the negative six, but I could multiply this and it would say, then this would become 16.76 with one extra digit micro Henry's. So that's my actual answer. For this particular example. Any questions on that? Let's see if I can write this red line. Uh, is this true for all sol solenoids? Yeah, this is the way uh, uh, basically the formula works out for a solenoid. Uh, the only characteristic numbers for a solenoid are really that cross-sectional area, uh, which they might just give you as a radius uh, instead of an actual area, and the number of turns and the total length. And notice how the I canceled out. If you ever get an inductance that has a current in it, 
or a charge or a voltage, just like if you get a capacitance with a charge in it or a voltage or a current, you know you've done something horribly wrong because capacitance and uh, inductance are both geometric uh, calculations or geometric quantities uh, that should depend only on the geometry. And in some sense, that mu zero out in front uh, would, would be altered in the event that you had something inside of the solenoid other than air. So it's not unreasonable, for instance, to take a solenoid and actually stick a piece of iron through the middle. Sort of like making an electromagnet. Same thing with a uh, toroid, which we've done before when we uh, when we were doing uh, first doing Ampere's law. We did a toroid, which is sort of like a a long solenoid that's been curled back into like a ring. So if you do that, you can actually have one continuous ring of say iron or something like that, and stick that inside. Then of course you'd have to change. Uh, the mu zero and use an appropriate quantity for that since it's not air inside. But yeah, other than other than changing out the air, that's that's the formula that you get for a solenoid. Any questions on that? Okay. Well, let me show you another example doing the same thing. This is going to be an actual uh, coaxial cable. So a coaxial cable is, uh, we've talked about it before. Remember we did capacitance of a coaxial cable, but it's basically the cable that runs either from your satellite dish to your TV, or it might very well run from uh, outside into your house to your cable box. But normally when you look at the end of it, it'll have some nice little threaded thing and all that sort of stuff. But if you were to take that threaded end cap off, what you would see is there's a thick black, uh, rubberish or vinylish uh, covering. Then inside of that is a woven uh, cylindrical wire. So basically they got wire sort of braided around into uh, almost like those old Chinese finger cuff things that you used to uh, play with when you were a kid. You know, the little uh, things you could put your finger in and you couldn't pull them out because as you tried to pull it out, it stretched it and made it tighter. Uh, so imagine taking uh, aluminum wire and braiding it like that. That's what the outer part of a coaxial cable is. Then inside of that is sometimes a little layer of paper or some plastic and then some sort of white silicone looking solid. And then inside of that is a copper wire. So the copper wire on the inside is the inner conductor and the wire cable on the outside, the, the, the braided wire is the outside conductor. Uh, so now I'm going to show you a typical example of how to calculate inductance, but this time for a coaxial cable. So here's our example. Oops. So what I want to do here is I want to find out what is L. Okay. So I'm assuming basically all the quantities I write down, I'll know. So what I'm going to do is I am going to say that, in fact, this will be, I'm going to draw the z-axis right here. So this will be the z-axis. I am going to draw the x-axis right here. And I'm going to draw the y-axis right here. Uh, actually, let's make that a little different. No, I don't want to do it that way. Let's see. I really did want to do it this way, but that, that seems like that's not going to work out right. Uh, okay, let's, let's regroup. I'm going to undo that, undo that and undo that, and I'm going to put my coordinate system down here, and this will fix it. All right, so here we go back to my coordinate system. Now I'm going to draw the coordinate system a little different this time. I'm going to put it at this end of the paper, okay? And I can still, yeah, I think I can still do it that way.
Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume there's a nice little uh, wire right here. that runs straight along that. And there's the, whoa. There's the other edge that runs straight along here. Okay. And then outside of that is another wire Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this distance right here is R1. Okay, evidently I got to take it off of making my drawings neater. So that distance right there is R1. And then this distance right here is R2. And I'm assuming we know this. Okay, so we know R1 and R2. And what I'm going to imagine is in fact that uh, for starters, this is going to be my x-axis. This is going to be my y-axis. And this is going to be my z-axis. Notice that is right-handed. That was part of the, the issue I was dealing with. Okay. And I am going to say that the current flowing through this is I, and it's going that way in there. And of course, it's going this way in this cylindrical shell. So I'm going to draw the cylindrical shell. No, I did not do me very well there. I was supposed to go back and make that nice. Why did I not make it nice? OK, hold on. Okay. So this is a current I out here too, but it's going the opposite direction. And then in between those two cylinders are is of course just air. So that's what we're seeing here. And I can sort of indicate that a little better. Uh, So this is just me trying to show you that this is in fact behind that. Hopefully that looks more three-dimensional now. <laughs> All right. Now, basically what we know is that there's going to be a magnetic field as a result of that wire in the middle. And that magnetic field is going to essentially point, let's say, like this. Okay. In other words, uh, the magnetic field will be pointing up directly behind it. It'll be pointing down directly in front of it. It'll be pointing out of the page directly on top of it, and it'll be pointing into the page directly below it, like that. So that's what the magnetic field lines are doing. And in fact, I am going to use Ampere's law, which says that the closed integral of B dot DL is equal to mu zero times I enclosed. And what I'm looking at is in fact, this magnetic field points out here, in other words, out of the page above the inner cylinder and into the page below the inner cylinder, like that, okay? And what I need to do is first calculate what that actual magnetic field is and then use that to actually figure out what my uh, 
figure out what my actual inductance is so that I can calculate or, or calculate what my flux is so I can calculate what my inductance is. Okay. So uh, this is going to be this little red line that I just drew here. That's going to be my Amperian loop. And its radius is R, which is greater than R1, but is uh, less than R2. Okay. In other words, this is my radius R right there. So, solution. I shall do my solution in red. First off, my hypothesis. Is that B is going to be some B of R in the theta hat direction. Now you see that was actually the reason that I was trying to make sure my coordinates were going right, because obviously right here, theta hat points this way. Right here, it would point, say, this way, and then right here, it points straight down, which is exactly you know, the way that I just finished explaining to you how this magnetic field behaves. So that is definitely the quintessential theta hat direction. The DL, on the other hand, will actually be R D theta, but it also points in the theta hat direction. So the left-hand side of Ampere's law, the closed integral of B dot DL, is going to become the integral from theta equals zero to two pi of B of R theta hat dotted with DA, or excuse me, dotted with R D theta theta hat, which you can see is going to be basically B of R times r times the integral d theta and of course theta hat dot theta hat is one so i'm just going to get two pi r times b of r so that's what my left hand side is my right hand side is supposed to be mu zero i enclosed which I think you can tell the only thing enclosed is I. And not only that, notice that I'm supposed to stick my right hand on that Amperian loop so that my fingers are curling around in the same direction I'm integrating that uh, over that loop. And then my right thumb will point in the positive current direction. So if you see, you grab your right hand or you try imagine grabbing that inner wire uh, with your right hand, you'd see that your fingers do, in fact, wrap behind upward, and then on top, they come out of the page, and then in front, they go down, and your thumb is pointing to the right, which is exactly the direction the current was going. If the current went the other direction, I'd have to write a negative I here. So uh, this is actually uh, acting in the right direction, so the right-hand side is just mu zero times positive I. And now all I have to do is set the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side to get the magnetic field. So left-hand side equals right-hand side gives me uh, 2 pi R B of R is equal to mu zero I. So finally, I see that B is equal to mu zero I over 2 pi R, all of that in the theta hat direction. And of course, this is for R1 less than R, which is less than R2. And that's the only place we really need to know the magnetic field to calculate the actual inductance. Now, again, uh, we need to think because in, in order for me to cal get, calculate the inductance, I need the flux. So I need to think of what kind of surface is going to be 
uh, such that the magnetic field lines go through it perpendicular to that surface, which is, of course, parallel to the vector that represents the surface. I think you can see when you do that, that the actual surface we want to do, uh, maybe you might look at like this. So let's say this right here has a length L and that would be the actual area A over which I plan to do my, uh, my flux calculation. So that's what I'm going to do. So the flux is equal to the integral of B dot dA. And you might realize that, in fact, the dA also points in the theta hat direction. And we're going to get the integral of mu zero I over two pi R theta hat dotted with now, in this case, I'm going to actually draw a differential area element like this. Okay, what I'm going to say is that dA is actually equal to uh, L times dR times theta hat. Notice the big deal with this integral is the integral of b dot dA, the b cannot vary very much because that's the integrand. Of course, neither can the dA for that matter. But the b being the integrand cannot vary very much over the differential area element dA, or else I'd have to look for an averaging process to account for what the magnetic field is doing. So if I allowed uh, the bottom edge of that little differential area element to be out a distance r, okay, and then the thickness to only be dr, then you see, since B only depends on R, it's only going to change by a differential amount uh, in going from one side to the other. So that's why this is acceptable. Everybody see what I drew there? I'm suggesting that this little part right here has only a thickness of dr. And in fact, this distance from the central axis, if you will, Try to clean this up a little bit better so it looks a little nicer. That's going to be the distance R. Some of that might have been nicer if I had just cleaned it up like this instead. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's what my differential area element is going to be. So I'll go back to writing that. Uh, what I said was it's going to be L times dr times theta hat, which of course allows me to bring in the mu zero I and the L over the two pi. All of that can come out front of the integral. And all I'm left with, in fact, is dr over R from R equals R1 to R2 times, in this case, it was theta hat dot theta hat, which I can make my drunk looking owl. <laughs> okay, to show that theta hat dot theta hat is one. So uh, I think y'all all know where this integral is gonna go. This integral, the integral of dr over R, does anybody recall what that integral is? Uh, 
is it one over r squared or negative one over r squared that's yeah you're thinking of differentiating this is the weird one where if you actually tried to do the differentiating you get a zero exponent that's what i use to remember which one uh which one's right so if i actually did my integration which means you add one to the exponent and then divide by the exponent the exponent right now is r to the negative one if i added one to that i'd get zero so that says to me oh hey billy that's not the right one uh, oh it's but, natural log there you go that's it so this is going to become mu zero times i times l over two pi times the natural log like you said of r2 over r1 because it really when you evaluate the integral it's going to come out to be the natural log but then you got to evaluate it the natural log of r2 minus the natural log of r1 but the difference of logs is equal to the log of the quotient so that's why i got that now i'm in a spot where i can actually calculate the uh inductance the inductance, of course, is L is equal to N phi over I, but in this case, the N doesn't mean anything, so it's just phi over I. So I can now say that the inductance for this L and by the way, they normally if, if you actually sometimes they'll actually ship the coaxial cable such that stamped on the outside it would have the number of ohms per meter uh, in principle it could also have the number of uh, farads per meter for the capacitance and it could give you the number of henry's per meter as well all that could be printed on the outside but you can tell with three different parameters that's a lot to print so sometimes they only put the the resistance and sometimes they only put that but you could look in the check uh the spec sheet I think it's R59 is, is the better quality uh, coaxial cable. I think it's R59. Is it R59 or R6, one of those, something like that. But either way, uh, you can check the spec sheet on it, and it'll give you the inductance per unit length. So it's quite often that we don't solve for L. We solve for L over uh, that little L there. But in this case, I'm just going to do it out straight. So if I go and calculate that this is the flux and I divide it by the current, I think you can see that I'm going to get mu zero times L over two pi times the natural log of R2 over R1. And that is actually the inductance. Of course, you could divide both sides by that script L and then you'd get L per uh, unit length and that would just be mu zero over two pi times the natural log. So that's another possibility. I know I tried to fit it in there kind of weirdly, but that's another thing you could actually write if you so desired. Any questions on that? All right, so that's pretty much the different types of symmetries we can actually use. Uh, I could also, by the way, so I'll leave this for you as an exercise. You could actually uh, go and find the inductance, for instance, of a toroid instead of a solenoid. And of course, in that case, the little cross-sectional area, remember a toroid is like a donut. So you're not talking about the cross-sectional area in the hole of the donut. You're talking about the cross-sectional area that's perpendicular to that hole. And in fact, there's one on each side or, or an infinite number of them like this that goes around that little area there because the magnetic field is going to be perpendicular to that going through, for instance, the batter or the dough of the, of the actual donut. That's uh, where you calculate the flux at. So it would actually depend on the radius of the little solenoid that makes the uh, that makes the toroid, but it also, of course, depends on the radius of the donut shape itself. So uh, just keep an eye on that. That's something you can do. You can probably find one in your uh, in the homeworks at the end of the chapter, and so on and so forth. So anybody have any questions on that before we move on?
All right. So since you seem to be okay with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on and show you some similarities between uh, an inductor and a capacitor. And I'm going to start by looking at the actual, uh, if I can find myself, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to start by looking at the actual power cal uh, power that uh, can be just sort of dispersed from the inductor. So power, remember, we from the very beginning, we knew that power, P, is equal to IV. That's one of the many versions. Of course, I can use V equals IR, and then that becomes I squared R, or I can use uh, I equals V over R, then that'd be V squared over R. Those are all fair game, but the one I'm going to use is, in fact, the P equals IV, and that P equals IV, I'm going to use it writing our script E, because then it spells the word pi, which I like. <laughs> I like the E, actually. Okay, now I can make use of that electromotive force uh, E, by realizing that Faraday's law says that the electromotive force is equal to the negative of the number of turns times the instantaneous rate of change of magnetic flux. So uh, using that, I could actually make some sense of what I'm doing here. Not only that, I could also make sense of the fact that uh, the magnetic flux can be written as I times L over N, okay? Uh, so when I write P, I'm going to say P is equal to I times N because I'm replacing that electromotive force now. Notice I will haphazardly drop plus and minus signs as long as they're multiplied, because at the end of this, I'm just wanting the, the magnitude of the quantity. I don't care whether it's positive or negative. And frankly, the uh, Faraday's law having that negative in it is more of something that makes it consistent so that you can plug it into other equations and that's fine uh i use it sort of when we're when it's being used as a standalone equation itself i just use it as a reminder to apply Lenz's law uh but you can pretty much drop it if you're just talking about magnitude so i'm going to drop that uh negative and in fact it doesn't necessarily have to be dropped in, in some cases the negative will actually cancel out all by itself but I can now say uh, I can now say that the Faraday's law interpretation by putting the n d phi d t in place of e, I get n times d phi d t. But if we go back and look at what we said about inductors, what we said about inductors was l is equal to N times phi over I. So that can tell you that the flux is in fact equal to I times L over N. So I can plug that in here. So this is now gonna be I times N times d by dt of, let's make this a square bracket now, then this is going to be i times l over n. When we do that, I think you can see that for starters, the l and the n are just constant, so I'm not really taking any derivatives of those, and the n is in fact going to cancel out with this n. So now what I have is l times d i oh excuse me i times l times d i over dt i had left off that i there okay now we know power is actually equal to dw over dt so dw and i hesitate to write it this way but it, it it pans out to a correct result. result. Uh, the reason why is the DW isn't necessarily an exact differential. 
uh, work sometimes depends on the path taken, in which case you can't just call this a DW. In fact, I'll often do something like writing a slash on it or something, but we're going to ignore that aspect right now. And we're going to say DW is actually equal to PDT. And I'm going to put in that P, which happens to be L times I times DI over DT times DT. Now you can see that the potential energy, which is really the integral of DW, remember when I calculated potential energy, for instance, or when we calculated potential energy in the first uh, semester, what we did was calculate how much work it took to lift the object of mass M a distance Y. And we did so in such a way that it would go very, very slowly so that it's always in equilibrium. So the force was just equal to mg, and then we ended up getting mgy. Well, that's the same thing that's happening here. We're going to do the work and set the work equal to the potential energy, and that's what's going to happen here. So what we see now is that dw is actually going to be equal to l times the integral of I di so that finally I get u is equal to one half l i squared. Now, this is where I want you to realize that for a capacitor, we found that capaci uh, that the potential energy stored in a capacitor was one half cv squared. So you can see there's obviously some relationship that, that makes a capacitor and inductor uh, similar. But also there's a very distinct difference in that the energy of the inductor is proportional to the square of the current where the energy in the capacitor is proportional to the square of the voltage. So obviously there's going to be a difference in that uh, capacitance is more favored towards voltage, say, and inductance is more favoring of current. Now, what I can also do, this, this is all, this is a very helpful equation all by itself. Okay. So I'm going to circle that off just so we'll know that's one of the ones we can use. Of course, we already used this one, but I'll circle it off too. But now what I'm going to do is just like I did with the capacitance, I found one half CV squared, and then I plugged in what C and V were based on a capacitor. And lo and behold, I got a fundamental answer that turned out to be exactly right, even though I derived it for, for a simple case of a capacitor. Well, I'm going to do the same thing now. I'm going to calculate the energy stored uh, for an inductor that happens to be a solenoid. And lo and behold, I'm going to get the right answer anyways. That's a more general result. So you scratch that, uh, U is going to be equal to one half times L. Now, what we found as the uh, inductance of a solenoid, if you remember correctly, was uh, L is equal to mu zero N squared A over L. So So that's actually the L. Now, the other thing we have to use is we need to use the actual uh, current I, and I need that current, for instance, in terms of L and so on and so forth. So to do that, what I'm gonna make use of is that uh, I can be found in terms of the magnetic field and the magnetic field was actually, did I, I want to make sure I, I actually pulled the L, not the magnetic field. Let me double check that. Yeah, I did. Okay. So the magnetic field, remember, was uh, mu zero, mu zero lowercase n times I was the magnetic field. So using that, B equals mu zero little n times i, which is also mu zero i times big N over L, I can see that i should be equal to B 
times L over mu zero N like that. B L B zero N. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to plug that in and say this is B squared L squared over mu zero squared times N squared. Now doing that, I can immediately see some things are happening. For instance, this N squared is going to cancel out with this N squared. Uh, this L to the two is going to become L to the one, canceling out that guy. This uh, mu zero to the two power is going to cancel out with this mu zero, leaving mu zero to the one power in the bottom. And ultimately what I'm going to get is one half b squared over mu zero and look what's left a times l can anybody tell me what a times l is for a for a solenoid remember the solenoid what it looks like Anyone? Okay, well, this quantity right here for a solenoid is actually the volume in the solenoid, which is the area where most of the magnetic field is. Remember, I told you roughly the magnetic field is going to be essentially zero outside of the solenoid because it's so strong in the solenoid that it's essentially uh, round offable, if you will, uh, outside. So what we found is lowercase u, which is u per unit volume, turns out to be one over two times b squared over mu zero. And that is in fact the energy density held by a magnetic field. In other words, even though we use the solenoid, uh, to find this result, the result is actually the correct one. And if they ever ask you to calculate the electric fee, or excuse me, the energy stored in a magnetic field, this is what you'd want to do. Now, you should also compare that to what we had found for the capacitor, which was lowercase u again, which equals u over the volume, was equal to one half epsilon zero e squared. So with that in mind, you see again, e and b looking very similar. The square of the amplitude, or excuse me, the square of the electric field strength is what the energy is proportional to, and the square of the magnetic field strength is what's proportional to the energy as well. Uh, you can also see that they have this inverse relationship between epsilon zero and mu zero, but that's actually the energy stored in a magnetic field. So we've now uh, derived that. So what we will do next time is I am going to tell you how these particular circuits, uh, how these particular inductors can be used in a circuit along with capacitors. I'm going to go through all of basically sections uh, 30-4, 30-5, 30-6, uh, 30-7, and the I will gloss over 30-9, 30-10, 30-11. Uh, those are things that it's good for you to know, but I'm not going to cover those for you. So uh, I will briefly mention salient points. In sections 30 dash nine slash dash 10 slash dash 11. But I uh, will not test you on them. And I'm going to put test 
underline it here because you might actually find them, quote unquote, in the homeworks. You might actually find some of them on the actual practice test. I've, I've tried to eliminate most of them, but some of them are still there. I don't mind you doing that kind of stuff in a homework setting, but I, I'm not going to test you on it. Any questions? We're actually done, by the way. So you guys are, of course, free to go. Uh, but we're, we're done. And uh, I'll wait for the last person to leave in case you have any questions. Professor Younger? Yes. Um, so I have a question about my midterm. I know that it's due Friday. Uh, so the first question is, are you able to open the practice midterm back up for me? Yeah, I thought I already thinking. had. In fact, I'd even I thought I emailed you telling you that I did that too, but let me double check. I tried to um do it today and it wasn't letting me. It's saying it was still locked. Okay. Oh, yeah. Looks like I, I think I might have did it in the wrong class. Come to think of okay. it. So let me fix that right now while I got you here. Uh so I'm gonna put you in here. Okay, so I'll, I will definitely say that's due. Uh, that's going to be open for you until. The 31st. Actually, I, I went and did it to April 2nd since that's the Sunday. I don't think they have any testing okay. hours on weekends, but just in case. And you don't need to take the respondents one at all because you're taking it at the testing center and with the testing center. Uh, they have everything handled, so I don't have to use the lockdown browser or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, so so then I am I do have to take that at the testing center. Yes, that's the what I normally do when I have to have a makeup test. Okay. 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 Thank you, Maya. And then um, for tests, I think test three and four, or at least test four, am I able to make that up too? So I wasn't okay. able to take in Let's that one. Check. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had a, uh, some students had some issues with that. So yeah, that okay. Yeah, it does look like you're one of those uh, that have missed it. Okay. Uh, yes, I am going to open those two back up for you and for the other person that missed. So uh, I will do that now. Okay. And hopefully, uh, I will make it do. Uh, I'm going to do April second as well. Well, is that give you enough time? For tests three and four? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. So what I will do then is I'm going to go down here. First off, I'm going to make tests three and four practice tests available to you because okay. that might come in handy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so practice test three is now going to be available for... I'm going to make this... Actually, I'll tell you what. I'll give you till Wednesday of next week. That'll be April 5th. For three and four. Uh huh. Okay. Just to uh, just so you 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 have enough time to work, focus on your final and and that sort of thing. I, I got to take points off for uh for doing the practice. I mean the actual test late, but not the midterm because you talked to me about the midterm and all okay. that. So. And then to schedule with the testing center. Um, do you know their email or how I, or is it uh, like? website i can just look it up you might there. be able to type in testing and it'll actually fill it out for you but i do go to the website okay. if you click on faculty and staff you'll see down at the bottom uh how it can allow you to contact the testing center but okay. or you can just do a search for testing center okay awesome all right well all have right, a thank you one. you're welcome you too. bye bye-bye i had a question yes um i took test four uh like march 19th and uh in the grading in the grades where it said grades i looked at test four the thing i got i didn't get it grade yet on it but uh yeah if I was going to modules. you missed it uh we, we were talking about that at the beginning of class evidently there was two tests four made and i've got to fix that you you were the only student that actually took the one that didn't count uh but somehow there was two out there and and uh, i just got to correct it and and do that hopefully i'll do that after class yeah, because when I go in, okay, you're going to correct that. Because when I went in the modules to look at it, it showed mm -hmm. how I did it. So 
I can't, you know. That's yeah, you did. It's just it's weird because you'll if you look closer, you'll find, you'll see that there's actually two of them, and you did one of them, but not the other. But that's not your pro problem. I'll fix it, and it should be fixed within the next day or so. Keep an eye on so, it though. If I don't remember, then obviously you want to get back with me. But I, I'm I'm hoping I will be able to remember. That would come. When's it going to be due? When I when you correct it, is it going to be like like next week or? Yeah, I would hope I do it tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, because it's showing that it's due tomorrow. So. Yeah, yeah. You, don't worry about any of that. That's not yeah, affecting you at all. So, uh, yeah, don't worry about that stuff. You don't have to retake it or anything like that. You're golden. All right. All right. Well, you have a good day, sir. All right. You too. Talk to you later, Joseph. Yeah. Bye bye. And that looks like everybody that's here. So, time to go. Bye bye.